Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you want to speak to us through your word. Thank you, Father God, that you are a God who speaks in many different ways. You speak by the power of your Holy Spirit to us. You speak in many ways. You speak through other people to us. But Lord, you speak powerfully and clearly through the word of God. So Lord, may we hear you, Lord Jesus, speaking to each one of us this day. Help us to speak to us through the word, Lord God. And Father, may we listen, may we respond, and may we draw closer to you, Jesus, we ask, in your mighty name. Amen. Let me just ask you a question. You don't have to shout out loud, but let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever, have you, any of us ever been in a situation where you really were not ready for something? It might have been a small something, it might have been a big, big thing, but was there ever a time you can remember, do you know, I'm just not ready. I'm totally unprepared. I don't know if you can think of one. I can think of one for myself. And it was back in 1983. And I'd been a Christian for probably a year, maybe less than a year. Uh, I was uh, a police officer, and I'd gone to a big Christian event with, I don't know, probably about 10,000 people there. It was called Greenbelt. Uh, it was all under canvas, great big marquees, and people during the day would come and speak, you know, quite well-known speakers, Christian speakers would come and speak and share. And then in the evening there'd be... In fact, that year, Cliff Richard, for those of you who know Cliff Richard, he was singing that particular year, I seem to remember. Um, it was 1983. And I, anyway, it's during the day, and I was at Greenbelt, and I'd gone to this big marquee, looked something like this, not exactly this one, but something like this. I'm sorry, it's a grainy picture from 1983, not my picture, but someone else's. And it, that was about half the size of the marquee, a great big marquee. And, and it was... Patrick Sugdeo was talking about being a Christian and an aggression. And it, the place was packed, 500 or so people in there. And I'd just gone, you know, just all innocence, just to, to go and listen. And anyway, halfway through, he, there was a five-minute break. And then there was going to be a... Yeah, there was a five-minute break. And during the break, an announcement came over the speaker, and it says, is there anybody here from the Christian Police Association? Well, although I was a brand new Christian, I had joined the Christian Police Association, so I thought maybe they got a problem. So I just went up to the person who gave the announcement, said, you know, what's the problem? And they said, are you the person who's meant to be speaking now? <laughs> no. I said, I said well, we, we invited someone of a Christian Police Association to come and give talk for about five or ten minutes on your, you know, your thoughts about being a Christian and aggression. Um, they haven't turned up. Could you do it? <laughs> I, I can tell you I had never, ever, ever spoken publicly in a Christian situation before. I didn't have a clue, and I, I, I couldn't say no. So I had to say, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So they, you've got about 15 minutes uh, before you know, you're going to be on. And then, by the way, afterwards, it's questions from anyone in the marquee who wants to ask questions. Gosh, you know. So I have to say, I felt very unready for that time. I grabbed a pen and a piece of paper and I tried to, I don't know what I jotted down or wrote down, I can't remember. God help me, I, I did something and sort of struggled through it. And then when it came to the questions and answers, they all wanted to ask the policeman questions. What do you think about this, man? So that was a time, I can tell you, I was totally unprepared. If I had known that I was going to be giving a 10-minute talk in front of 500 people, I can tell you, I would have been prepared. I would have thought about it, I'd written something down, I'd at least been ready. But this is the first time ever, first ever time I had ever spoken. I never, I wasn't a preacher, I wasn't a pastor, I wasn't anything. I was just a you know, police officer. And, um, and the reason for sharing that story is, I wasn't ready for that occasion, I can tell you. Totally unprepared. Panicking, nervous. I'm sure my knees were probably knocking and whatever else, you know. But that was just to give a five or ten minute talk. Let me tell you, how about you and I? Are you and I ready for the second coming of Jesus? Are you and I ready for the return of Jesus? Because... 
it is critically important that we are, as we're going to see as we think about Daniel chapter 12. And um, so learn from Daniel and learn from my mistake as well. Make sure that you're ready for the return of Jesus. It's the most important activity that any of us can be engaged in. It really is, as we're going to see. And just before we make just uh, a few points, the end times is spoken of a great deal in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus spent a lot of time talking about his return. Uh, It's not just the odd Scripture. It is many. In fact, there are 318 references in the New Testament alone to the second coming of Jesus or to the end times. That's a lot of references. 210 chapters in the New Testament, so that's about one reference for every 30 verses. That's a lot of times. And Jesus spoke a lot about um, second coming. And in the book of Acts 111, when Jesus has finished his mission on earth and he's returned to heaven and the disciples are looking up and it says in Acts 111, men of Galilee, the angel says, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. And the early church would often, when they greeted the early church, shortly after you know, Jesus returned to heaven, the early church, they were expecting Jesus to come return any day. They knew that he came the first time, Bethlehem, 2,000 years ago now. They were expecting the return of Jesus at any point in time. And if they met one another, they sometimes say, Maranatha, which means the Lord is coming. When did you, when did I ever go up to someone and say, the Lord is coming? Um, But it's a great way just to keep our cutting edge sharp and to keep ourselves looking and ready for that time and not just getting a bit tired or letting the world sort of um, drag us down. So let me make a few points from Daniel chapter 12. And the first one is this. The end times is a time of distress. First one says... There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago and was raised from the dead. From the moment that the kingdom of heaven began to come in following his mission completed and accomplished on earth, I would say that from that moment on, we have been in the end times. And the end times isn't just futuristic. It is future, but actually, ever since Jesus came to this earth, in a sense, we have been living in the end times. And you might think, well, I haven't seen any end times. Let me tell you, if you look back through church history, you will see distress, you will see tribulation, you will see persecution within 20 or 30 years of Jesus returning to heaven. In the early church, they faced incredible persecution. And in AD 70, when Nero blamed the Christians for everything that was going wrong, he absolutely terribly persecuted the early church. They went through, they had to flee Jerusalem. And the reason the gospel spread, why, was because as the Christians fled from Jerusalem, they told everyone, everywhere they went, Jesus is coming, Jesus is real, Jesus is alive. They went through incredible tribulations. All of the disciples of Jesus were martyred for their faith. I call that some distressed tribulation. Don't just think of tribulation as a futuristic, in a futuristic sense, which some people, some pastors, some preachers like to make it out to be. The tribulation has been happening to different degrees and different levels, and in Western countries, possibly, well, not actually, not in the UK, certainly, but in many Western countries, you might think, oh, I haven't really seen any tribulation. Let me tell you, if you look around the world over the last 2,000 years, and even today, there are so many nations where Christians are facing distress, persecution, discrimination, harassment, tribulation. Not in Thailand, praise God. There's freedom of religion here, and we should welcome that and be thankful to God for that. But there are many nations where there is not that same freedom. Just because we might not have, although many here have, 
experience tribulation. Don't think it's just a futuristic sin. It's been happening right from the beginning of the early church. And what it does say, the Bible does say, that is at the end times, the end of the end times, shall we say, yes, the tribulation will get even worse, if that were possible. And there will be the appearance of an antichrist. And, but there have been many antichrists right throughout history. Um, Nero, many of the Roman emperors were anti were like Antichrist in their spirit of totally opposing anything to do with Christianity. And that's happened right across the history of this world and is still happening in many nations today. So yes, we shouldn't be surprised. So when sometimes we read the papers and we see things that are distressing, we shouldn't be surprised. We've read it in the Old Testament, in Daniel. We've read it in, from the lips of Jesus. We've read it in the New Testament. We shouldn't be surprised, but we should be prepared. So when those distress people oh, didn't, no one told me there'd be never any problems being a Christian. Um, we'd never have you know, persecution. The Bible doesn't actually say that. What it says is there will be these times and we need to be prepared and prepped and ready for those times whenever it might affect us personally too. Will I stand for Jesus or will I not? Daniel, as we saw in the, this wonderful book of Daniel, stands for Jesus, goes to the lion's den because he's standing for Jesus. What about you and me? And so there will be times of distress and it will get even worse towards the end of the end times. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 24 and verse 21, for there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Almost an exact mirror of what... Um, is written in the book of Daniel in verse 1. So we need to be not surprised when that happens, but we need to prepared, be prepared for it, and we need to keep um, following God well. Second point. End times is a time of deliverance. End times is a time of deliverance. Again, still in verse 1, it says, But at that time your people... And then it defines who your people are. Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. That's amazing. So the end times, we shouldn't just think of it in terms of fear and trepidation. As Christians, in many ways, we should be praying for that to happen. We should be praying for God to return. And what does God want to deliver us from? God came to deliver us from the power of sin, from the power of Satan, from the power of death, and from the power of hell. Praise God. We see it happened at the cross, but actually, when Jesus returns the second coming, there will be deliverance from all that is evil. But it will, and it's deliverance from evil, and it's deliverance to an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise God. It's a wonderful deliverance. It's a deliverance that we should all want to receive and experience and know in our own lives and know that it's going to happen finally. And it's already happened at the cross for those that have put their faith in Jesus, but it will happen completely and for eternity as Jesus returns. So we should welcome that, but we need to be ready for that. And it says interesting specifically about the book of life. What is the book of life? Well, let me tell you what the book of life is. There are quite a number of references to it, both Old Testament and New Testament. In the book of Revelation, we see that the book of life comes to the fore again. And it says, who is going to be delivered? Question mark. Everyone whose name is written in the book of life, in God's book of life. Now, we can't just get a pen and write our own names into God's book of life. Jesus is the one who writes our names into the book of life. And in a sense, he writes his name, our name, in his own blood. As we receive and confess and say thank you to God for what you've done in my life. Forgiving, asking for forgiveness for our sins. And thanking God that it's Jesus alone that can make us right with God. So whose names are written in the book of life? Every Jew and Gentile who believes in Jesus the Messiah. And for those who've never heard, Jesus will deal with them fairly and justly. And for those who live before the time of Jesus, we don't need to worry about that. God will deal fairly and, and fairly 
uh, unjustly with those, but it's all those who, who have responded to Jesus Christ, truly responded to him, not just, I once said a prayer a long time ago and I you know, haven't really done anything since. It's actually about intentionally following Jesus. And all of those will, names can be confident and written in God's book of life. But that's not every name. And, and let me tell you, God wants every single person living on planet Earth, he wants every one of their names to be written in his book. There's not a single person that God says, I don't want to write that name's person in the book. He wants, his, God's heart of God is, that everyone's name should be written in his book. That's why he came, not just for a few people or favored people, for everyone, for all. And so my question is, to me and to you, is my name, is your name written in that book of life? Yes or no? And if we're a committed Christian, we're really following Jesus, and not just in our heads, a little academic prayer of commitment, but actually with our lifestyle. We can be confident that Jesus, at that moment that we become a committed Christian, it's as if he writes our name in to the book of life. As I say, we can't write our own name in. It's his name. We can't, we can't get there by being just good. It's Jesus alone that is our passport into that book of life. So, is my name written there? Is your name written there? I can tell you for the first 21 years of my life, my name wasn't written in that book. I'm sure of that. I wasn't following Jesus. I was doing my own thing. I vaguely believed in God. He was up on the clouds somewhere, probably. Um, <clears throat> very nice of me to think that, but um, th that's as much as it went in terms of my relationship with God, really. First 21 years of my life, my name was not written in that book, I can tell you. It wasn't until... I repented and I turned to Jesus and asked him to forgive my sins and welcome into my life. And since then, I've tried to follow him as well as I can. Yes, still made plenty of mistakes, still making plenty of mistakes, but my heart is to follow Jesus 100%. And that's what should be for every Christian. We're seeking to follow Jesus every day, not just falling back, well, I prayed a prayer of commitment 50 years ago, and um, that's good enough. That's not good enough. We need to be following Jesus every day. So, is my, is my name, is your name written there? And do you know what? Today, you can answer that question for all if you're not sure. I'm not sure. The only thing we need to do is to confess our sins to God, repent of our sins, be truly sorry, thanking Jesus for dying on the cross for us, inviting him into our lives, and choosing to follow Jesus every day from this moment onwards for the rest of our lives. When we do that, and we make that true commitment to following Jesus as Savior and Lord, Jesus writes our name in the book of life. So anyone here, if you're not sure, you can be sure today. And I would say, if you're not sure, then make sure you are sure by the end of today. Don't leave it one day longer. Does that make sense? Because God longs to see you in heaven. He wants you to be with him in heaven. But we have a choice whether we accept Jesus or whether we reject Jesus. That's our choice. And the choice we make is the biggest choice we'll ever make in our lives. And do you know the famous uh, theologian um, died now called R.C. Sproul, Bible commentator. And um, he, wrote, uh, he wrote this. He said, When God writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life, he doesn't do it with an eraser in his hand. He does it for eternity. Isn't that good news? It's a confidence, not the arrogance, but the confidence we can have as a Christian that actually our names are written in the book of life. So that was the second point. Make sure your name's there. If you're unsure, come and see me. Come and speak to someone. We, I would just love to pray a prayer to, that you can be sure that your name is written in the book of life. Third, third point is this. End times is a time of eternal destiny. End times is a time of eternal destiny. Heaven or hell. Verse 2 says this. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting shame. 
the Bible's clear there are only two eternal destinies. Heaven or hell. There's no in-between. There's no moving from one to another. It's an eternal destiny and the, the Bible could not be clearer about that. It's not it was just mentioned once in scripture somewhere. The, the doctrine of heaven and hell is on virtually in every verse of the Bible. It's a doctrine that is so clear, so apparent. It's not just for the, some people who will only preach end times preachers. You know, we've probably heard them and seen them and plenty of them on YouTube. Be careful who you watch on YouTube when it comes to getting an accurate view of the end times. But um, there are many who will only preach end times, end times, end times all the time. But actually, there are two eternal destinies, heaven or hell. And, and that is a choice again that faces you and I. And I'm not saying this to try and put a heavy on us or anything like that. God longs, God wants every one of us to be with him. Let me give an illustration. There's a phrase uh, you probably might have heard of called um, face the music. It's time to face the music. And if you look up, there are different explanations for where that or originated from. But let me tell you a I think a true story from a long, long time ago of somebody who had to face the music. And it was uh, in a particular nation, there was a wonderful imperial orchestra, and there was a very wealthy, influential person who loved the orchestra, and he knew that in a little while they were going to be playing in front of the king, and he wanted to be in the, in the orchestra. The only trouble was that this particular person could not play a musical note on any instrument whatsoever. But because he was a, quite a dominant, uh, influential, and wealthy person, he went to Guthrie and said, I want to get into your orchestra. And Guthrie said, it's not possible. He said, I insist. So the conductor allowed him to come into the orchestra, and what they did, they sat him quite a number of rows back, and they gave him a flute to play, except... And he didn't know how to play the flute. He just mouthed it. He, he faked it. He would go, sorry, that, any flautist here, I apologize. That, that is not what a flautist does, but you know what a flautist blows into the, into the, into the uh, flute. But he never, he, he just went through the motion, didn't actually make a single sound on his, his flute, just pretended to, to, to be playing. And that carried on for about two years until there was a change of conductor. And this new conductor was coming with a, you know, <clears throat> going to run a tight ship. He wanted, to, he wanted to audition every member of the orchestra. Every member of the orchestra, whatever instrument they had to come, they had to play before the new conductor. And this man was starting to get a little bit nervous. And he went off sick the first time, and the second time, now I've got to hear you play. And he had to own up that he was a fake. He had to own up that he couldn't even play a single musical note and that he'd just been faking it. He had to face the music. And let me tell you, the second I share that illustration as a way of illustrating the second coming of Jesus will be a time when every person in the history of the world, we will each one of us face the music. Except we won't be facing a conductor and can we play a tune. We'll be facing Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who wants to invite and welcome us into his presence. But if We've rejected him. we said, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I want to just do my own thing. That's not okay. And there is a time when every one of us, as it were, will face the music. And you might think, Matthew, why are you teaching this stuff? Why? Well, A, because it's very biblical. And B, because I would be a bad pastor if I was not somebody who actually would have preached what the Word of God says. I'm just preaching what has been orthodox Christian teaching throughout the generations. But maybe many preachers don't really want to preach on this because it's a little bit sort of direct. And let me tell you, Jesus was direct all the time. All the time. He didn't pussy around and, you know, fluffy sort of... He was clear in his teaching. The Bible is clear in his teaching. And I'm just sharing this with you because for me not to do so would be for me to fail you. For not to do so will, will be to not be a good pastor. And maybe some pastors don't want to preach a clear message. But actually, the Word of God tells us clearly what is the teaching of Jesus on this one. So for me, I do it 
longing that every one of us here would know that our names are written in the book of life, that every one of us here would have got right with Jesus. It is the most important decision you and I will ever make. There's no other decision you'll ever make in life that begin to come anywhere near the significance of what we do with Jesus, how we relate to Jesus, how committed and serious we are to Jesus, or whether we're just going through the motions of You know, because church isn't just, well, we've always done church for the last 500 years this way. I only like if we do it this way. That's not what church is about. Church is about a close relationship with Jesus Christ, following Jesus as Savior, Lord, and King. And much of the rest doesn't matter as much as we often think it does. So I say that. Let me, each one of us, May each one of us be ready to face the music, to face our creator, to face the God who loves us and died for us and rose from the dead for us. May we be in a right relationship with him when the time comes that we face him at the end of times, which will be um, judgment day. Next point. End times is a time for wisdom. End times is a time for wisdom. Verse, 12, verse 10 sorry, says, Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Here we have, and in verse 3 it says a similar thing, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. There are two sorts of wisdom. The wisdom that the Bible refers to is the wisdom of God. It's a godly wisdom. The other sort of wisdom is a wisdom of the world. Oh, you don't need to bother about God. Oh, that's ancient. The Bible was written, you know, over a thousand years ago. You know, you don't need to... The the wisdom of the world is not a godly wisdom. Actually, often it can have a satanic wisdom be a satanic wisdom and not a godly wisdom. Because a godly wisdom will not push you towards God. It will, godly wisdom will, uh, sorry, worldly wisdom will not push you towards God. Actually, worldly wisdom will push you away from God. Godly wisdom will push you towards God. And there's a verse, Proverbs 1 verse 7, that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God, the fear of the Lord, The fear of Jesus is a beginning of wisdom. And that's not a fear like, I'm terrified, I'm I'm afraid, I'm scared. It means a healthy respect and a reverence for God, which is what he wants to see in each of our lives. I remember, I think a little while back, I preached on Matthew, probably we were doing a series in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. And um, it was about the wise and foolish virgins And who were the wise virgins? The wise virgins were those that were ready for the coming of Jesus. They were those that had got their oil and they'd trimmed their lamps. And when the bridegroom bridegroom arrived, they were ready to meet him. The foolish virgins were those who hadn't got their supplies with them. They weren't ready. They were like me at Greenbelt, not ready for anything. Certainly not ready to give a talk or anything like that. They weren't ready. And Jesus, if you read the parable of um, Matthew 24, the, the, the ten wise and ten foolish virgins, Jesus is really clear on exactly this teaching from Daniel 12. There's wise and there's foolish. Make sure as a Christian you're a wise Christian. You're following Jesus wisely. And you're not following the world unwisely. And the other great thing here is um, in verse 10, um, which which says, um, verse 10, which says, many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. Do you know, lots of scripture is all about Jesus. In fact, a healthy hermeneutic, a healthy way of understanding the scripture is to say, what is this passage, what does these verses tell me about Jesus? And actually, you can apply that to the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And Daniel 
chapter 12, verse 10 says, it's a, it's a Jesus-focused passage, and it says, many will be um, purified, made spotless and refined. Who does, who's that pointing to? It's pointed to Jesus. How are we made spotless? How are we refined? How are we made pure? It's what Jesus did on the cross. It's why as Christians we have someone to celebrate. We have the King of kings and the Lord of lords who come by his Holy Spirit to live within us. That's amazing. You can shout hallelujah loudly. It's incredible. That is who God is. That's what God wants to do. And um, that is who God is. He, Jesus is the one who can shape us, refine us, purify us, wash out all the muck and the mess of our lives. When I became a Christian, God had to wash me a lot, get rid of a lot of spots and blemishes in my life. And, um, and that's what God does. And Jesus does that. And that's why it's Jesus who writes our names in the book of life, not us writing our own name in. So that verse 10 is all about Jesus. And um, Jesus cleanses, Jesus purifies, and Jesus makes us right with God. Nearly the final point. (laughs) The end times is a time for evangelism. End times is a time for evangelism. Back in verse 3 here. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. One of the things that Christians should be doing is getting right with God ourselves individually and helping other people to get right with God too. And when it comes to mission, evangelism, outreach, let me tell you, ever since Jesus returned to heaven, now is the time. Today is the time. We don't put it off. Are we going to do it in 10 years' time? Now is the time for sharing the good news of Jesus. Now is the time to be a witness. Do you remember on a couple of the previous chapters of the book of Daniel, we read about Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, amazing testimony. God turns around this demonic worshipping king to be a, a follower of God. And then later, King Darius, he also is transformed to be a, a follower of God. And I encourage you to write out, think about your testimony. What is your story about what God has done in your life? How, what was your life like before you really came to know Jesus? How did you come to know God, to Jesus? And what's your life like now? And any aspect of those times, we don't have to tell everyone the whole lot all the way through. Sometimes just a little snippet of our testimony, we can speak into a person's life. Now is the time to be doing that. I think I have had, I've encouraged you twice previously, to write out your testimony, just a few words, and just send it to me, a paragraph or two. I think I've had three now. Three of you, thank you for those three, that have sent me a testimony of how they came to faith in Jesus. And the reason I'm asking this question is because it's not just preachers that are meant to be preaching the good news of Jesus. God wants to use you. He wants to use every one of us here. If you love Jesus, your Savior and Lord, he wants to use you to tell other people about Jesus. Not everyone else do it. You do it. I do it. Each one of us. And so I encourage you. The Bible says, do you want to be righteous? There's one thing that you can be doing as we all get ready for the end times. Those who lead many to righteousness, those who lead many to a right relationship with God, will shine like the stars forever and ever. If you want to please Jesus, share your faith with other people. Don't be a silent Christian. Don't tell. And you might just do it lovingly and gently and respectfully. It might be to your family. It might be to your neighbors. It might be the colleagues you work with. You don't have to get up and do a 35-minute talk. (laughs) You might just say, do you know what? There's a God who made the world, and he loves you so much. You might want to say, do you know what? Actually, God did this in my life, and I'm just so thankful that I've got Jesus as my God who's with me always. There are lots of different gentle, subtle ways. It doesn't have to be a a full works preach every time. But the more we're open to God using us to share our testimony, the more effective we'll be as a church and the more pleasing to God you and I will be to a church. Because if we're a church that never tells anyone anything about the good news of Jesus, I can tell you we're failing as a church 
It's not what God wants for us. God wants us to be confident as Christians. He wants us to be courageous as Christians. He wants us to share the good news of the love of Jesus with everyone. And as 99% of Bangkok never heard it, you might be the first and only person that ever says, do you know what, can I just share what, how, how God's made a difference to my life? It doesn't have to be heavy, it doesn't have to be awkward, just natural and easy. And the more that you pray every morning, God, would you give me an opportunity today to share my faith in Jesus? He will. I can, t- I can guarantee he will. So now is the time. That's one of the things we can be pleasing God with as we you know, get towards the end of the end times. And what did Jesus say? Again, this was 2,000 years ago, and it hasn't changed. Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus says, And this gospel, that is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, comma, and then the end will come. Evangelism and telling people about Jesus is on the heart of God. It's not just on a preacher's heart. It's on the heart of God. He wants us to be active and intentional telling us about Jesus. And I know you might hear me say this point a number of times. I don't apologize for that. Maybe I'll stop doing it when I know there's so many people just running out in every direction to, 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 to share the good news of Jesus. But that's what it says. And actually, this leads in to our final point as well. End times is a time unknown. The early church thought that Jesus would come any day. I think Paul, as you read his letters, thought Jesus could come at any point in time. Daniel, clearly, from chapters 7 to 12, and in the earlier chapters as well, some of them, appointing the whole timeline of history, which the whole of creation is working towards when Jesus is going to return. And there are some, there are many actually, uh, and many good Christians too spend far too much time trying to work out every minutiae detail of the prophetic in Scripture, which is wonderful, I can tell you, for the sermons. But you can spend forever over the minutiae of Scripture, spend hours and hours, days and days, almost a whole ministry, trying to work out exactly this prophecy means this, this prophecy means that, and, and then well, probably it's, you know, that's that, that's that, and working too hard to try and tell God when he's going to come again. The Bible says, and God is clear to Daniel as he has given him some incredible visions and revelations and dreams. He says, seal this up. This is for the time of the end, Daniel. You don't need to worry about the exact date. God knows. No one else does. And we need to probably be a little bit less concerned of exactly which day, which month, which year, what's going to happen in order for that to happen, had to happen, happen, happen. But actually, the Bible says, what should we be doing as Christians? Worrying a little bit less about that, but but concerned very much with being an active, committed Christian. God's advice to Daniel is, Daniel, don't worry about the minutiae of the end times, exactly what it's going to look like. Go your way. Go and serve the king. Go and serve me. Go and follow me well. And that is the best way that you and I can be preparing for the end times. Not trying to think we've worked it all out from Scripture, although it's great to study Scripture, I encourage that very much indeed, but actually to spend time living lives now that are on fire for Jesus and are making a difference wherever we are. So that is the best way that we can be prepared for the end times. Yes, be aware that Jesus is coming soon, but not get too hung up on the exact minutiae of when, but making sure that we're ready and that we're helping others to get ready too. Now is the time. Seize the day as Christians. Seize the day. And if you're a committed Christian, then I would encourage you, allow the reality of the second coming of Jesus to affect your life, to affect your ministry, to affect how you serve God well. Be a bold Christian, because now is the time. And God is looking to see how I, how you, he wants to see us as as wise virgins, working well for God and being ready and prepared for the time when he'll come again. If you're here and you're thinking, hmm, gulp, Matthew, this is a bit serious. I was expecting just a lightweight sort of sermon and just gloss over things. And if you know that you're not right with God, then I would plead with you, I would urge with you, there's no pressure, no arm twist, it's your decision to get right with God today. 
Don't leave it one more day before you get right with him. You can know, you can walk out of this church today knowing that your name is written for eternity in, in God's book of life. But for that to happen, you need to make a genuine commitment to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. And if there's anyone here and you, that is you, you know God's speaking to you, you know God's saying, now's the time, I need to get right with God. Please, please get right with God today. And just come up to the front. There'll be some prayer ministry afterwards. Come up to, and, and talk to one or two people on the prayer ministry team. They can lead you in a prayer of commitment to Jesus. Come and talk to me. I love to pray a prayer, leading people into a relationship with Jesus. So if that's you, please don't just slink off and forget about it. Sort it today, that you will all be ready to face God when the time comes. Let's just uh, stand up for a moment. Let's all stand up just for a moment. Just, uh, we've been sitting for a while. Let's stand up. And let's just listen to God. Might like to close your eyes. Just listen to God. What is it that God is saying to you? Sorry, I didn't show you the last six points up on the slide. The summary points are uh, just going to come up on the slide uh, just for those for whom it's helpful. I know some people like to take a screenshot or something like that. Which one of those particularly strikes home to you? What is it that God's saying to you? Are you open to the Holy Spirit speaking to you and thinking, hmm, God, yeah, I think you're saying something to me here today. What is it? And whatever it is, allow God to speak to you and allow God to make you to be the man and woman of God he wants you to be. So let's close our eyes. I'm just going to pray. Father God, I just ask and pray that each and every one of us here will be a person who is ready for the end of the end times, Lord God. That each one will be ready for that day when you return. We sang it at the beginning. He's coming on the clouds. Jesus, you will be coming on the clouds and every eye will see you. May we be ready for that day when the Lion and the Lamb returns, when Jesus returns. Father, forgive us individually and as a church, Lord God, where we're, we're off the boil. Jesus, put us back on the boil. Lord, may we be red hot, white hot for you, Lord Jesus, serving you well, loving you well, operating in the fruit of your Holy Spirit, in the gifts of your Holy Spirit, in the power of your Holy Spirit. May we be attractive Christians to other people as well, Lord. Forgive us when we're not. And Lord, I pray for anyone for whom today is a day for them to get right with you, Jesus. I pray that as they pray, and maybe they find someone to pray with them, prayer um, a little bit later on, I pray, Jesus, that you will come and take up your residence in their hearts and in their lives from this day onwards and for eternity. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' wonderful and mighty name. Amen.